Have the Irish government and farmers agreed on an emissions target? And is Texas properly conducting environmental assessments for road expansions? Welcome to the Climate Recap from the Beckersphere Climate Corner, your go-to place for international and U.S.-based climate news. I'm Becky Hogue, a science writer. Today is Monday, August 1st. Let's jump right into the news you need to start your day. Let's start with some extreme weather events. Climate change made the UK heat wave 10 times more likely, according to a World Weather Attribution Rapid Analysis. The UK hit a record 104.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 40.3 degrees Celsius on July 19th and is heading into a drought this month. Scientists determined climate change's impact on the heat wave by analyzing weather data and computer simulations with the climate of today versus the climate of the past. Historical weather data would have put this heat wave 4 degrees Celsius cooler than it ended up being with human impact. All of these studies are peer-reviewed. Overall, extreme heat in Europe is getting worse and more common faster than expected. A little while ago, I reported on how Seville, Spain became the first city to start naming heat waves. I was wondering about it the other day if they had named any because we all know Spain's been through heat waves, but I guess none have been severe enough to get a name. Heat waves are put into three categories and only the most severe get names. But they've officially named the first one Zoe, according to the heat wave ranking system Prometeo Sevilla. They name heat waves in reverse alphabetical order. The system decides on the category ranking based on not only the highest temperatures, but also nighttime lows, humidity levels, and the heat's effect on human health. Meanwhile, the northernmost part of the U.S. had its wettest day on record last Tuesday. Utkiagvak, Alaska, formerly known as Barrow, saw 1.42 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. Great gusts of wind brought the storm over to several northern parts of Alaska, including the better-known Fairbanks. Time for a climate study. A new study published in the journal Nature Geoscience found that simply re-wetting global wetlands can effectively reduce how much carbon emissions they release. Wetlands have a lot of greenhouse gases stored in them, so any strain on those ecosystems is very dangerous for the biosphere. There's still a lot scientists don't know about wetland mechanisms, but this study determined that keeping the wetlands neither flooded nor drained will keep stored enough CO2 to make up for the inevitable methane and nitrogen oxide emissions caused by warming. Seems like a pretty easy fix. Let's check out some climate victories. Ireland officially set targets to half greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. The hardest part of forming this deal was that agriculture is the largest emission sector, representing 38% of overall emissions. The Green Party wanted a 30% reduction by 2030, and the farmers wanted 22%, so they met in the middle with 25%. Reducing emissions in the agriculture sector requires reducing the meat and dairy industry's size and switching to more sustainable agriculture practices that require less chemical intervention. The government also wants to see a 70% emissions reduction in the energy sector, a 50% reduction in transport, a 40% for residential buildings, and a 35% for industries. The Climate Action Plan will require $144 billion or £125 billion in public and private investment. In the U.S., the Biden administration released a new initiative to expand community solar among lower-income households to bring down their energy prices amid high gas prices. The effort is being run by the Department of Energy and the Department of Health and Human Services. People can opt into off-site solar projects to earn credits that are applied to their electricity bill, hopefully lowering it. The initiative will also develop and test a digital platform to connect participants of the federal low-income home energy assistance program to community solar options where they live. The program helps 5 million households pay for heating, cooling, and weathering their homes each year. Colorado, Illinois, New Jersey, New Mexico, and New York will test out the community solar initiative. Meanwhile, the Department of Energy also signed off on a $102 million loan guarantee for the Australian firm Syra Technology to expand a Louisiana plant that makes graphite-based components for electric car batteries. This is part of an ongoing effort to increase clean energy domestic production. The vast majority of electric vehicle parts come from China and the U.S. is not even on the map right now. The plant is expected to create enough battery anode materials to make around 2.5 million EVs by 2040. The graphite will come from the Syrah Mining and Processing Plant in Mozambique, which also supplies Tesla. Now we've got quite a few climate fails. 
Unfortunately, the International Energy Agency, or IEA, expects global coal demand to match a record high set in 2013, 8 billion tons in a year. Coal is in demand worldwide as gas prices are exorbitant, but coal demand was actually rising last year too as economies tried to rebound from COVID lockdowns. Coal use grew by 6% last year and only another 0.7% this year, assuming China bounces back from its latest lockdowns. Before the pandemic, coal was dying, so it's really sad to see the most carbon-intense form of energy making a comeback. European countries call this trend temporary as they speed up clean energy development. India, who's leading this trend right now, isn't moving on clean energy fast enough. Its coal consumption increased by 7% this year. China, which represents about half of the world's coal demand, actually saw its coal use decline by 3% in the first half of this year, but it's expected to trend upwards for the rest of the year. China has the largest clean energy supplies in the world, but its grid isn't ready to take it up yet. As the war in Ukraine continues, Shell announced it made over $12 billion or 10 billion pounds, a record profit, from April to June while inflation was at a 40-year high. Energy costs are a primary driver of inflation. The company promises to give out almost $8 billion or 6.5 billion pounds to shareholder payout. This record beat the previous record made in January and March of this year by 23%, literally profiting off of the war and struggling households. We have some more fun news. A new study by the Imperial College London determined that official reports on how much carbon has been captured and stored underground from 1996 to 2020 has been overestimated by 19 to 30 percent. This overreporting is due to inconsistent reporting requirements and claiming the plants capture as much as they can hold, which is not always the case. Most of these reports are done by think tanks. Reports should include intended capture rate capacity, maximum capture rate capacity, annual capture of CO2, annual transport of CO2, annual storage of CO2, quality assurance measures such as third-party auditing, and reasons for any offline periods where CCS facilities could not operate as intended. CCS is an important technology to reach our decarbonization goals due to how long we've waited to tackle this problem, but it needs to be done in the most transparent way possible so we're not accidentally cooking ourselves by relying on it. Also, it doesn't mean that we should keep using fossil fuels. We often think that the main driver facing elephants is poachers, but it might actually be climate change. Kenya officials say climate change-induced drought kills 20 times more elephants than poachers. The country has been in drought for four decades now, and Sava National Park is seeing elephants leave in search of food and water or die. Last year, at least 179 elephants died from thirst, while poaching claimed fewer than 10 lives. While tackling poaching is important, it's overshadowing the main driver killing elephants. Last September, Kenya's president declared a state of emergency over the drought, which has caused more than 4 million people to suffer from food insecurity and malnutrition. Two weeks ago, the U.S. said it would provide $255 million in aid to Kenya. In South America, Brazil's Environmental Authority just granted the initial permit for a major highway to be paved through the heart of the Amazon rainforest. The road, called BR-319, would connect the largest Amazon city, Manaus, to the rest of Brazil. This road was originally attempted in the 70s, but the project fell into disarray. It will unintentionally make it easier for illegal loggers and land grabbers to more easily access more remote areas to carry out their business, resulting in a five-fold increase in deforestation by 2030, according to a study. That's equivalent to an area larger than Florida being deforested. Bottom line, it would be a death sentence for the forest. The Amazon is an essential carbon sink, biodiversity hub, and regional weather controller. The current Brazil president, right-wing Bolsonaro, will compete in an election in October. Speaking of roads, Texas is determined to expand the I-35, which the Department of Transportation determined has no environmental impact despite consuming more than 2,000 acres of land with dozens of streams and creeks and demolishing nearly 100 homes and 63 businesses. How is this possible? Well, the department split the space into four to make the environmental impact look negligible, according to research by the grassroots group TXDOT. 
The group is suing the state's Department of Transportation for failing to conduct honest environmental analyses for approving projects. The I-35 story is just the latest in a string of highway expansions that the department has deemed to have no environmental impacts. In fact, out of 136 projects from 2015 to 2022, only six received full environmental assessments viewing their impact. This case brings up the question, should a Department of Transportation be in charge of environmental impact assessments in the first place? This matters for the climate because honestly, part of the environmental impact assessments should include potential emissions increases. Highway expansion encourages more cars on the road, which means more emissions and air pollution. And over 2,000 meat industry cattle died in Kansas from heat stress as the heat and humidity skyrocketed. Cattle that die from heat stress don't get used for human consumption, but they are converted into animal food, fertilizer, and other products. Unfortunately, this mass death and quick decay from the heat overwhelmed the demand, and the companies had to dump the cattle in a mass grave in a Kansas dump. It reportedly smells horrible, and there's risk that the waste can seep into groundwater. The meat industry says it's learned to feed cows less grain, which is high energy and can make them more susceptible to heat. Hay and silage are better. But some companies like Five Rivers are not bothering to consider other things like adding shade because it was a, quote, rare event. Climate change is unfortunately going to make these events more and more common. Well, that was a list of not great things. Let's finish off with one more climate victory story. Center-right conservatives in the UK started a new party called the Climate Party to challenge more than 100 seats of Tory MPs that don't support climate action in the next election. The founder is Ed Gimmel, a former army officer and city lawyer, and he signed up the party on the hottest day in UK history. 19 MPs are part of the Net Zero Scrutiny Group, whose whole point is to oppose any climate action. Climate change has a voting base, as we saw in Australia when the independent climate-focused Teal Party took a few seats in the last election. They purposely focused on seats held by climate-denying or delaying conservatives, and the conservative Labour Party lost its majority as a result. So we'll have to keep an eye on this UK party. And that was your Climate Recap for Monday, August 1st. If you like the work I do, please follow this podcast, give it a five-star rating, leave a review, and consider checking out the Becca Sphere Climate Corner YouTube channel. Remember to talk about the climate crisis every single day and to support your local news organizations. Bye for now.